What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to TOJ Talks. I'm your host, Will Parkinson, at WillPaw11 on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. We just had an earthquake here in uh, the New York area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Boston, wherever. Apparently, people felt it in Philly. Uh, that was wild. I thought there was, I don't know what was going on, but um, happy to be joined. Second time, I think, on the pod, yeah. uh, hosting Good Morning Football, 13 years in the league, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Jason McCordy of Good Morning Football. Jason, how are we doing, man? I'm doing good, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, I saw somebody tweet, like, the Northeast shows you how close we are. The fact that this earthquake was felt in so many different states at the same time where everybody's tweeting about it. So, yeah, it was it's kind of crazy. Yeah, I uh, it's been a no- totally normal week in New York. You know, we wind every day. Like, I feel like my house is going to fall over. It's, it's a good time. Um, obviously, you know, lots occurred in the NFL. I want to quickly – we're going to talk some Jets, obviously. We're going to talk a little bit of kind of the AFC East. One thing that happened um, that – because of kind of the current situation of the show, you didn't get to really talk too much about. Stephon Diggs got moved, uh, I guess, yesterday, two days ago. Already reworked the deal, which there was no chance he was ever playing on a one-year $18 million deal. Um, what are your thoughts on just that overall? And then we'll talk some Jets, but obviously it affects the Jets a little bit. He's probably the best receiver in the division is now, uh, is now in the AFC South. Yeah, kind of crazy. Just the buildup, too. Obviously, last offseason, I think it was minicamp where it was Diggs was in the building and he wasn't in the building, and everybody was making a big to-do about him and Josh Allen's relationship, and it was like, no, 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 none of that's going on. And then, obviously, his production towards the end of last season, not only did it drop target-wise, it didn't look like he was as involved in the offense. So you fast-forward to, I remember everybody, yes, the other day, they were talking about Somebody tweeted, like, did Josh Allen need a Stephon Diggs to be great? And he was like, you sure? And then next thing you know, the next day he goes to Houston. So I look at it for Buffalo. As you look at their wide receiver room right now, there's question marks. You picked up Curtis Samuel. You still have uh, Shakir there, uh, Khalil Shakir, who's had a really strong end of the season. And they picked up Mac Holland. So you're looking at it like, all right, well, Diggs is gone. Who's going to be the guy to step up? I would assume they get somebody in the draft. But from a Josh Allen standpoint, he's a guy that you look at what Mahomes has been able to do when he left, lost Tyreek Hill. Is Josh Allen going to be able to weather that type of storm and be able to use those guys? Now, having Dalton Kincaid, Dawson Knox, that lessens the blow a ton and maybe even opens their offense to get more 12 personnel and do some other things. But people will say, like, all right, Stephon Diggs' production went down. But what sometimes you fail to realize is do other teams feel as though Stephon Diggs' level of play has gone down? Because if I go into a game and I don't want to leave my corner one-on-one with Stephon Diggs, that just opened up something else for the offense. So whether he's getting the ball every single play and putting up huge numbers, he impacts the way a defense treats the offense, which also opens up for other people. For Houston, I mean, this is huge. The GM there, Nick Casario, I mean, they're going all in. You hit on your quarterback. You move up to get Will Anderson. You guys end up making the playoffs. You blow you blow out the Cleveland Browns, and obviously you fall short to Baltimore. And now you double down Daniil Hunter and you get Joe Mixon in a trade. Now you add a guy like Stephon Diggs. And to your point, you reworked the contract where now it's a one-year deal. He's getting paid probably what he feels he's worth. But also, like, now i got to go prove to doubters that I'm still him. I'm still that guy. So you're going to get the best Stephon Diggs with a C.J. Stroud. The AFC South just got a lot more interesting. I think Tennessee Titans got better adding Calvin Ridley. But Houston, I mean, they're obviously the clear-cut favorite in that division. And they're, they're going to make noise in the AFC. How much does yet to be determined? Yeah, look, I, I think of the two games I think the Jets open with, like, they're both – I think they'll open at home because they're going to want the ratings. But it, it might be the Bills. The Jets play the Texans again this year. And C.J. Stroud's one game last year where I thought he looked horrible was the Jets made him look, like, really, really bad. And there are some really cool – teach tape from a DB perspective on some of the things the Jets were doing. Nico Collins got hurt and it was like, it yeah. was as much as I love Robert Woods, um, post ACL Robert Woods against Sauce is not really a fun matchup for the Texans. And that could be one of those games where it digs and Sauce and the whole thing. Um, I agree with you. I don't know how much worse it makes the Bills, but it certainly doesn't help them. And they're not exactly in a spot where, look, we've seen receivers go in the 20s and be very good year one. We've seen it a bunch, but I know I've seen a lot of Bills, oh, we'll trade up and get Roma Dunze. Like, buddy, um, getting from 28 to 7 or 6 is you're going to need to give two or three first-round picks yeah. like you're trading it for a quarterback. And does that one rookie receiver take you to a Super Bowl? I'm not so sure. So um, I think it's more likely they maybe trade up to the teens for Brian Thomas or something like that. Mm-hmm. That's maybe more of a realistic possibility. As you mentioned with Houston, 
all, all due respect to Adam Rank, I, I hope it was a troll tweet. He's like, NFL teams should copy the Texans and and get a rookie quarterback and go all in. Like, yeah, that's usually if the, rookie, if the rookie quarterback hits. Like, yeah, that'd be cool. The Jets have tried that nine times since I've been alive, and I'm yeah. not even thirty yet. So, um, yeah, I, sure. Um, <laughs> but I guess in in terms of how it affects the Jets, obviously. Um, look, I think Buffalo is a team they match up well with. And, you know, Miami is obviously – they had a lot of injuries last year. They kept their quarterback healthy, though. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I guess, what do you think of their offseason as a whole so far? They've made a lot of one- or two-year commitments to guys. I think the only guys that have gotten two-year deals are John Simpson, got a minor two-year deal, mm-hmm. and then the kicker and the punter. So, uh, everybody oh God, else – yeah, yeah, more is that. He's, he said he wants to play seven more years, which um, I hope he does. Awesome, uh, awesome dude. But – what do you make of their offseason as a whole? They've added some big names. They've added some guys who, you know, they've got a lot of former all pros on that team. It's a matter of staying healthy, I guess, and, and how much those guys have left. No doubt. And when you say it's a matter of staying healthy, it starts at the quarterback position. You bring in Aaron Rodgers. We have, we went through the whole hard knocks and all of that. And in four plays, the look on everybody's face in that stadium season was over at that point. So when you talk about the offseason, the fact that Morgan Moles and Simpson, Tyron Smith, the fact that you went and shored up the offensive line, the entire hard knock season, it felt like you were continuing to talk about Makai Becton and can Dwayne Brown stay healthy? And you're talking about the offensive line. Well, the one thing that we may say may be the Achilles heels of the Jets is, uh, so this offseason, they say, you know what? We're going to invest out and we're going to go get offensive linemen that we feel like are going to help get us there, help keep Aaron Rodgers healthy. Now, obviously, you're getting Mike Williams on the outside. He's still coming off an ACL. But getting somebody to pair with a Garrett Wilson is huge. But I think the offensive line is the biggest thing because without it, we, we need to see the best version of Aaron Rodgers. And now he's 40 and he's coming off an Achilles. And as great as Rodgers is and as much as Robert Sala and everybody wants to say, like, I would never doubt Aaron Rodgers, he's still 40 coming off an Achilles. So you want to do everything you can around him to make sure he can perform at highest level. I think one of the biggest things that probably a lot of people aren't talking about as much is Brees Hall now will be healthy from the very beginning of the season. Last year, as you're watching it, we got, got, they went out and got down with Cook, and it was like, all right, we got Cook, we got Brees. It didn't work. But Brees Hall was on a pitch count early in the season, and you saw the glimpses. And now, from get-go, he's going to be there and you got a better offensive line. So there was games where you're just like, you have no idea how Brees is able to come up with 95 yards or doing some of these things. They can open up more holes and get him going. I think that's a huge deal for them. So having him healthy from week one is going to be a big deal. Yeah, like if you told me, this is probably slightly embellished, but if you told me next year Brees Hall is a top five finisher for offensive player of the year, like I wouldn't be shocked. He had 1,500 total yards last year. Um behind the worst offensive line, the worst quarterback in the league. Like yeah. that, you know what I mean? Like the, it, it should only get better. And he's a guy who early in the year, like as good as he was week one right away, I think he was like five carries for 120 yards, whatever. He probably scores on two or three of those. If he's even 10% healthier, yeah. um, you know, and he, I don't know, he's, I, I've, I've come off a uh, major surgery before that first time actually having to sprint 90 yards. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. Your, your legs get so tired. I feel like bricks. So, um, no, I, I think you make a good point there. This defense is something that's is super interesting because, you know, number one in EPA per play the last two years. Um, and they lose Huff, and there was just a lot of frustration, I think, of, hey, he's a 25-year-old, homegrown dude, first guy with 10-plus sacks as an edge rusher in 15 years for the Jets, and, like, really well-loved, this underdog story, everything, undersized, all, all that. Nice. I, don't really, I guess he's undersized. but And then they let him walk to Philly. And for like a pretty reasonable number, um, humbly said he was going to get three for 51 in October. It's, he got three for 51. And you're like, damn, like they go sign Javon Kinlaw. Sure. Like exciting former first round guy was underwhelmed a bunch in another talented group and they're good and they're still going to be good. But like the sign Reddick's trade kind of came out of nowhere and in a vacuum, like getting Reddick over Clowney probably is, is a much more you know advantageous move for them. Uh, what do you make of Hassan Reddick, the player? Because I feel like he's one of those guys, Jersey dude. Uh, I think he's a Temple guy as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. And, like, we don't talk about him a lot, but, like, low-key was a top four finisher and defensive player of the year 24 months ago and had 16 sacks, five force fumbles. Like, that's really goddamn impressive. I don't know why we don't talk about him as much, but other than Miles Garrett, he's the only guy with 10-plus sacks in four straight years in the league. Yeah. So pretty good player for a third-round pick in, in 2026. 
Exactly. And what you just said, double digit sacks in four straight seasons. So you're talking about somebody that when you put on the edge and now you're putting him next to Quentin Williams and the other side of John Johnson. So like now you're adding him to an already deep offensive defensive line. And to your point, I felt like a year ago we were talking about him because that Philly team was setting the NFL record for sacks and they're knocking quarterbacks out of title games. So we're, we're talking about Hassan Reddick, the player. And I still think to your point, as great as it is to have a Hassan Reddick as a fan, as a member of the organization, no different than Saquon Barkley a little bit down the street, where it's just like when you draft a guy or you bring a guy in, this is the first place he's in, and he hits and he develops, especially Saquon totally different because he was a high drown pick. As soon as you brought him in, a guy like Bryce Huff, you bring him in and it's three sacks and it's five sacks. And then next thing you know, like you're seeing the progression year by year. Like that's the guy you try to almost pay in year three with the anticipation that by the time year four comes, we already see what's going to happen because we've watched it and we've developed it. So as a fan, you're like, those are the guys we want to keep here, especially the ones that good locker room guys set an example because when the next guy comes in, that's who we point to. We're like, no, 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 like go talk to Bryce Huff. Like when he first got here, he didn't see the field. And then he did these things. That and but at the same time, that's just the way this business works. As a general manager, as personnel people, you have to look at a player and say, We feel like he is at this level. When the numbers are past that, then you're like, All right, like we love him, we wish him the best. And give them credit for going out and making the Hassan Reddick trade because we've heard for a long time, all right, Hassan Reddick's on the trading block. Philly's trying to get rid of him. And as soon as they signed Bryce Huff, it was like, all right, well, he's probably going to be the first one out the door. So now you're getting a guy, not only with his production on the field, but now you're getting a guy who played in the Super Bowl a year ago. So now he knows what it looks like from a team uh, standpoint. And he's a veteran where he's been around the league. He's been on multiple teams. So you're adding somebody, a veteran to the locker room that's been through things and has gotten to the level that we want to get to be able to uh, give off that advice and be in the locker room. Yeah, and plus he's a Jersey guy. So Jersey football, extremely underrated. Um, Low-key, like a lot of dogs. No uh, doubt about comfort, it. You know, no, not, not present company included. But um, no, like Reddick's a guy you mentioned knocking quarterbacks at the title game. He knocked Brock Purdy out of the title game, um, you know, a year and a half ago. And I just think that he's one of those guys that – also always durable. And again, I'm sure knock on wood, but like the Jets, a lot of the offseason moves, um, the two things I think we've talked about the Jets a lot is like they've done a really good job of getting assets for guys that were, you know, Sam Darnold and Jamal Adams. And we, you know, we keep praising Joe Douglas on that in that 2022 draft. And we should. Um, the other thing they've done a lot this offseason, make good moves, but a lot of those guys have injury questions, right? Yeah. Tyron Smith, yeah. um, you know, Mike Williams in a vacuum, yeah. like <laughs> this roster is yeah. sick. But Sam Reddick is n- like proven player that's, still in his twenties and oh, by the way, has missed one game due to having COVID his entire career. Like that actually matters. And, um, you know, we talked a lot about when you were on the show last year, how good could this defensive back, you know, room be for the jets. I still think they're probably a body light at safety. Um, I still think they probably could add, look, I, I don't know if they'll be able to do it, but Quandre Diggs or Justin Simmons in this defense and saying like, F it, like, we're in a title window. We might as well go really be in one would be, would be special. Um, but even that corner room, um, Michael Carter's probably a top five nickel, if yeah. not better. He's the guy who, as you mentioned, he should be extended this year because his price is only going to go up. Um, he's another guy who day three pick has worked his way up, you know, played as a rookie and it was like, yeah. whatever. And then obviously DJ Reed, another guy. And we <laughs> just saw, we just yeah. saw a Teron Johnson. I was just going to say, yeah, we've seen these guys getting paid like slot, yeah. slot DBs just hit they're, they're resetting the market again. Yeah. You got, you want to be ahead of it, not behind it. And then obviously sauce, I think it, this, the discourse around sauce is really weird for me. And I, I wanted to ask you kind of opinion on this is like, do you think it's like, is it, I don't know. What is it jealousy from other people? What is it? Because he kind of seems like he's, generally speaking, doing the right stuff all the time. His play is awesome to watch. He is like a humble dude who came in. He's been a first team all pro both years, but he gets so much hate from around the league. And I don't really understand why I, like, I know he likes to talk shit and like, that's fine. But every DB talk shit, I don't really understand why that's a problem. Um, I guess kind of, can you talk about this cornerback room, but specifically what discourse around sauce is just weird. And I don't really know what to make of it. Cause every interaction I've had with him in person, like literally the nicest dude possible. Yeah. Well, so I saw like the Asante Samuel stuff with him 
And I felt like, but that's Asante. I feel like he. Yeah, he, it's like the classic, like the '90s basketball guys versus the 2010 guy. Like that's what it felt like a little bit. And Asante, the way he looks at the game, Asante was unbelievable at taking the ball away. And there is a form of defense where that's not you can't replace that. Like a guy that can you can line up there, and somehow or another he comes up with two interceptions, force fumble, whatever it is. Asante Samuel was a ball magnet. So. When he looks at the importance of the DB position, the cornerback position, I mean, he's gone at Revis. Like, I don't know that I've seen a cornerback play better football than Darrell Revis. I would rival that with the 2019 Stephon Gilmore, which I got a chance to see up close, which was unbelievable. Like, you go get him, their best player, who they want to throw the ball to 15 to 20 times a game, and, like, we'll see you after the game. I'm not you saying know. that you guys didn't team win that Super Bowl, but, like, Stephon Gilmore was, like, this dude's the best player on the field, and that's sharing the field with Aaron Donald, who might be the best defensive player ever. When, like, you, design, that good. when you design your defense around a cornerback, like, that says something. When we're playing the Green Bay Packers in 18, and it's just, all right, you got Devontae Adams, and, like, we're all just going to go play defense. You just got Devontae. And then, oh, yeah, when we want to double-team Devontae, you go get somebody else because we don't need to take you up on double team with a guy. Like that's and and that's like Gilmore wanted that. Like he would look at me, I'd be on the other side, and we'd call the defense in the huddle and it'd be like one double seventeen. And he'd be like, Jay, you you go to the double. I'm going away. Like that that was his demeanor. And I look at Sauce, and although he doesn't always match up, he's a guy that when you come in the league as a rookie, as a cornerback, that shit is tough. Like you can be as good as you want. You get in there and you're now going against a guy where you're probably playing against the best quarterbacks you've ever played against. So I used to tell people all the time, like receivers are good at every single level. Like they're fast, they get in and out of cuts, all of those things. When there's a dog at quarterback, when you're going against Ben Roethlisberger and he's throwing the ball to A B twenty times a game and ten of those times is gonna be an eight second play, it's hard to cover him. So for Sauce to come in as a rookie and go all pro, and you can talk about interceptions all you want. And, yes, that's something that he want, you're going to want to see him improve on because he is one of the best cornerbacks in the NFL. Like, we need those takeaways. Like, when the ball hits your hands, we got to have them. But at the same time, if I can match you up on a wide receiver who is a huge part of their offense and, like, he shut down – you can't replace that. Like now we can roll coverage over another guy. We can commit to the run. There's so many different things as a coordinator that we can do. So not only Sauce, but when you look at their room, I don't think DJ Reed played as well as he played a year ago. But when you look at their room and there's Michael Carr, and when you can just play man to man and feel great about your matchups on the outside, that changes things. A third down, especially you get to when it's winning time in a two minute drill and you feel like your guys out there can handle it, and you can go man-to-man and send pressure at a quarterback. Uh, like they, I said it before the season, they have one of the best cornerback rooms in the NFL with those three guys that they line up. And it's different because they play man. Like, yeah, they play zone, but they go up there and they press and they get in your face and they cover you up. And I feel like to win at a high level in this league, you got to have guys that can play man-to-man. Yeah, there was a couple of times last year, people got pissed, you know, Sauce wasn't traveling and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. Against Keenan Allen on, on Monday night, like, that game was one of the weirder games, I think, all year. Like, Justin Herbert had 90 yards and got sacked a million times, and they still won by 20. Like, made no sense. But um, shout out Zach Wilson, baby. Uh, but regardless, like, I just feel like Sauce was traveling on third downs. And when you have such a good room, sometimes it's like you just trust your guys. It's just like we're going to play what we're going to play, and, like, you're not going to beat us. They've given up one 300-yard pass in the last 40 games. Like, we're in the NFL where 300 people, you know, Zach Wilson, Mike White, like Trevor Simeon are throwing for 250, 300 yards. And like, this isn't the early, you know, 2000s, late 90s, where, you know, Kurt Warner putting up 280 yards a game was like, this is changing the NFL. Like, this is, I don't know, you know, we've seen some 5,000 yard passers in the last couple of years that I aren't exactly going to stroll into Ken. So um, I I wanted to ask you a little bit before we kind of just move to like some of the bigger picture looking forward stuff. You know, Hassan Reddick, there was a report out of Philly. I guess yesterday, two days ago, hey, you know, they thought he was chasing sacks. Mm. I wonder, the only other guy I've seen do that, he's amazing. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. J.J. Watt did that a little bit at the end of Houston, and it was really obvious. And, like, I think everyone around the league kind of knew it, and I'm sure J.J. Watt would admit he would. He's, he was doing it, maybe if he got him a couple beers in. Um, I don't. I didn't see that on tape last year. I don't really know where that came from. And Like, can you just explain what that means to people who might not understand what that means? And then, B... 
Um, it looked like Fangio, whoever kind of mentioned Bryce Huff as like a three, four outside linebacker type stand up where Reddick wanted to put his hand in the dirt. If that's the case, like the Jets don't have, they play that wide nine. Like they're not, the guy's not dropping into coverage. Like you, yeah, you, yeah. Are, you are bending the edge. So Reddick's a perfect fit there. But you can kind of just mention what chasing sacks means or guys that chase interceptions. I think we hear more of that, uh, uh, Trayvon Diggs and these other guys where it's like, mm-hmm. you might want to jump around. Jerome Bland did that a lot last year. It mm-hmm. works out mm-hmm. sometimes in other games in the mm-hmm. Seattle game, you get cooked. Um, can you just kind of explain, I guess, what that means for like more in like layman's terms? Yeah, the interceptions is funny. I had a, a veteran when I first came to the league, Nick Harper, and he used to talk about Asante that well. He said, as a cornerback, Asante knew you might double move him and score a touchdown, but he's going to get a pick six and he's going to get a second interception because he understood route concepts. The whole chase and sacks thing, philosophy-wise, is interesting to me because when I first came in the league in Tennessee, we had a D-line coach by the name of Jim Washburn. He was a terrific D-line coach in the NFL for a very long time. One of his sayings used to say, we'll tackle the run on the way to the quarterback. We played with wide nines, and he wanted all his guys to be disruptive. And it was all about getting the hell up the field and go for sacks. Go get the quarterback. If the quarterback hands the ball off, hopefully we can get an arm on the running back and bring him down. There was a lot of discourse around that of people saying, like, all right, we got guys, especially sometimes we get where there would be no wide receiver and you just have a tight end set on the nub side. And I'm the cornerback there, and I have the gap between the tight end and the tackle. My end runs up the field and the running back cuts up. Now I'm one-on-one with Maurice Jones Drew in the hole. He's knocking my helmet off. So, like, as a DB, there's times where you want your guys to say, hey, like, don't rush up the field. But I think sometimes from the viewpoint of now, like, crossing into the media, becoming a fan, we watch him and say, oh, he's chasing sex. You have no idea what he's taught on that play. It could be we're bringing pressure and he has the boot on the play. So he's getting up the field to contain the quarterback. So I think when you start to say things like that, like we're just guessing because everything is just falling to shit in Philly. So now we got to find different people to blame and we're poking holes at what this guy's not doing. And then also the fact that stuff is falling apart in Philly last year. Maybe you do have, whether it's Hassan Reddick, whether it's Josh Sweat, maybe you do have guys saying like, yo, I got to make a play. Because we were just 10-1, and one, and next thing you know, we're just losing game after game. So we have to figure those things out. But I think the chasing sacks thing, I, I, if, unless you're coaching a player and you know exactly what he's being taught, you can't determine whether he's chasing a sack or not. Because even from the J.J. Watt standpoint, I remember we had a guy, Jarrell Casey, when I was in Tennessee, we literally would put defenses in where he was allowed to do whatever he wanted. And the linebacker knew it might be whatever the call was, 99. And he didn't have to control his gap. He could, If he saw something or sent something, he'd get up the field. You would put calls in that because you have guys that are special at certain positions that you want to give them the freedom so they don't do it on a play where you need them to be in a certain gap and they jump out. But I, I look at it, to your point, of more of a fit standpoint. Hassan Reddick, a guy that's been in the league for a while that's had success. And if I've had success putting my hand in the dirt, the hell are you talking about coming here and I'm going to be a 3-4 outside? Like, mm-mm, like... Because then I'm going to go out there and I'm going to have six sacks. I'm not going to be as productive. I'm going to get beaten coverage. And then a year from now, you're going to say, hey, we're going to need you to take a pay cut. Because when we turn the film on, you didn't play as well as you did from the years prior. And he's like, of course I have. I'm not because I'm playing out of position. So, no, like send me to a place where I feel like I can thrive in that. Well, you're talking about a Bryce Hub who's 25 and you've only known one system. So now you're like, well, hell, I'll try it. Let me see how I can do at that. That may unlock something different for me where Hassan Reddick might be like, no, nah, I've gone through that. So I think from a scheme fit standpoint, that's the most important thing. Get a guy in the right scheme and let him use the God-given ability that he's been blessed with. And that's where you get the production. Yeah, look, uh, if you look at Hassan Reddick's first three years, the Cardinals wanted him to be a weak side linebacker and he 